All right. Um, hello again. Welcome back. Um, so just to quickly recap what we've covered so far uh, from chapter one, um, we've understood what altars are, what their meaning is, uh, what they stand for, uh, so many other things. Um, and amongst, amongst so many of it, one of the key things that we see that it was a place of worship, it was a place of adoration, it was a place of surrender, it was a place where death took place, blood was spilled, uh, and it was, it, it was a place where God was honored. So that was the context of our altars. And uh, we saw uh, in very briefly the background of Abraham, that God called him from polytheism to monotheism, from, from a religion of multiple gods to one God, an invisible God. And we see that Abraham obeyed. And out of the four altars uh, that we started studying, uh, the first, uh, we finished the first two altars. The first one was the altar of obedience. God called, Abraham left without any hesitation, without thinking twice. Um, and the second altar was, symbolizes an altar of intimacy and uh, an altar of a pilgrim walk that, that Abraham had his eyes, his heart set on things above. Uh, more than just the earthly things, that he was not looking for cities made of human hands, right? Um, so we see that his intimacy level with God was growing deeper and deeper. Okay, so that was the two altars we looked at. Um, let's continue uh, with the third altar in your notes in page number six. Um, the third altar, uh, we're calling it the altar of commitment and separation. The altar of commitment and separation. Okay. Um, later, he went on, went to another place, Hebron, and built another altar. Okay. Wait. Share the map again. So, sorry. Okay, so from Ur, he comes down to Shechem, then Bethel, then he comes down to Hebron. All right. Um, we see that later he goes to a place called Hebron and he builds another altar there. Um, so in these three places, Abraham built three altars. Okay, so this altar is associated with Abraham's communion and his relationship with God. So, uh, but before he got there, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 10, this is what it says. Genesis 12, verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. Okay, the famine was really bad, uh, and so Abraham decides to leave the land that God promised him, and then he goes to Egypt. Okay, that's what's in Genesis chapter 12, verse 10. Okay, uh, now this is come to Genesis chapter 13. And uh, I've mentioned only Genesis, uh, the verses three and four in the notes, but let's read from verse one. Okay, Genesis 13, verse one. It says, so Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev, with his wife. Negev is a wilderness, okay? He's again going down south, NEG, okay? And again, if you go to Google and uh, in Google Maps or Google Images, whatever, if you put the Negev, it's a huge, it's a, it's a wilderness, it's a desert, okay? So Negev, desert. Um, so Abraham went up from Egypt to the, ne to the Negev with his wife and everything he had learned. Okay, um, sorry guys, ap apologies. Let's reverse a little bit. Let's go to the last verse of Genesis 12, okay? Genesis 12, verse 20. Apologies. So you know everything that happens when uh, Abraham is in Egypt, right? Uh, he goes to Egypt, he lies to the Pharaoh about his wife, Sarai, saying that uh, that's his sister and not his wife. 
and then there's uh, you know God sends a plague on the Pharaoh, and then Pharaoh finds out that Sarah is actually Abraham's wife and not a sister, and then he confronts Abraham, saying, "Why have you done this to me? You know, uh, you bring God's judgment upon me. Why have you done this? So leave, go." That's what Pharaoh says, and uh, in verse verse nineteen, why did you say she is my sister? So that I took her to be my wife. Now then, here is your wife, take her and go. Verse 20, then Pharaoh gave orders about Abraham to his men, Abram to his men, and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. That's the context. Now with that in mind, when we enter chapter 13, it says, so Abram, went up from Egypt to the Negev with his wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him. Verse 2, Abraham, Abraham had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. Means Abraham in Egypt, during his time in Egypt, had become very rich, okay, very wealthy. And he came out with a lot of, with great substance, with great possessions. So, once again, just pause. This is, an, again, just a foreshadow of what the people of Israel uh, would kind of come out of Egypt. From, okay. Uh, let's just hold Genesis 13 for a minute. Let's just jump a couple of chapters. Go to Genesis 15. Genesis chapter 15. Um, let's look at verse 13. Okay, Genesis chapter 15, verse 13. Is everybody there? Yeah. Genesis 15, verse 13 onwards. It says, Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be a strangers in a, in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years but I will punish the nations they serve as slaves, and afterwards they will come out with great possessions. Okay, again, uh, so and, and when you read Exodus, uh, you see that when Israelites came out of Egypt, they came out with great substance, with great position, with a lot of silver and gold, and it is with those golds that they used to build um, first the the idol, uh, what is it? The oh my goodness, sir. okay. The altar, uh, the bull, right? Yeah, the golden calf, golden calf. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, so that's the context here, right? Uh, let's just continue to read. Gen uh, now, let's go back to Genesis chapter 13. Genesis 13 from the Negev, he went from place to place until. He came to Bethel until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had been earlier and where he had first built an altar. There Abraham called on the name of the Lord. Now, something about the point, it just tells me that, okay, for a certain period of time, it seems like Abraham kind of forgot God's promises, his covenant. So he went away. And then moving from one place to another, again, like not knowing where to live, he came back to the place between Bethel and I. Okay, Bethel means the house of God. I actually means vanity. That's, that, that's what AI, H-A-I, originally, that's what it means, okay? Um, so, again, coming back to your notes, in altar three, Abraham's trip to Egypt was a sad commentary, except for his wealth that he made. Okay, uh, when he came back, for, when he came out of Egypt, he came out of two problems. One, he became rich, and the other one was that Hagar came along with him, okay, who would eventually go on to become his concubine. Right. Um, so he came out of Egypt. He built an altar of restoration. For his former commitment. Now, again, if you look at 
verse 5, okay, Genesis 13, verse 5, it says, Now Lot, who was moving about with Abraham, also had flocks and herds and tents, but the land could not support them uh, while they stayed together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. Okay, now, see, because of his riches, somehow, uh, it seems to be a problem between him and his nephew. And verse 7, in Genesis 13, verse 7, and quarreling arose between Abram's herdsmen and the herdsmen of Lot. The Canaanites and the Perizzites were also living in the land at that time. Verse 8, guys, okay, pay attention, verse 8. So Abraham said to Lot, Let's not have any quarreling between you and me or between your herdsmen and mine, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go left, I will go right. If you go right, I'll go left. And uh, Lot looked up and saw the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered like the garden of uh, of the Lord, like, like the land of Egypt towards Zoar. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lord, we all know that he chooses Sodom and Gomorrah. It, it, it looked pleasing to the eyes. It was, was green and lush and looked perfect to graze his flock and whatnot. Okay. Uh, this is another side note. It's really not important, uh, you know, in terms of what we are going to study, but just uh, the way that Abraham parts his ways, right? The patriarchs of those days, they would guide in, uh, you know, which direction they should go, and they would always go towards the east. Okay, so if they're going towards east, to the left will always be the north, and the right will always be the south. So in this context, what Abraham is telling is that okay, hey, if you want, if you're going. Uh, left to the north, I'll go south. And if you want, if you're going south, the right, I'll go left to the north. That's just a small, con uh, you know, uh, geographical understanding of of that of that scripture there. Okay. Um, so let's just come back to the notes here. In verse, in Genesis chapter thirteen, verse eighteen, it says then Abram moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. Okay, that means that something happened before verse 18. So verse, if you come back to verse 14, in Genesis 13, verse 14, the Lord said to Abraham, after Lord had parted from him, lift up your eyes from where you are and look north and south, east and west. Okay, remember this verse 14, God said, okay, the Lord said to Abram, after the Lord went, lift up your eyes from where you are and look north and south, east and west. All the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. So, after all of this, when after Abraham decides to separate himself, uh, to, you know, he he comes back to this land from Egypt. Then he's like, he realizes that okay, no, I've, I've I've been away from the land that God promised. I've been away from the promises of God. And then when he came back with great substance, uh, when he decides, when he lets his nephew choose the place, when, he, you know, Abraham could have easily chosen the place that looks beautiful, that looks lush, that looks perfect and nice. But Abraham, again, decides to separate himself, uh, you know, um, and let the Lord take the best place. And then God shows up. Uh, when he wants to recommit himself and he decides to separate himself, God shows up. And says again, he reconfirms the promise, the covenant that he tells him in Genesis 12. As a response, Abraham builds another altar. 
Okay, and that is that's what we see in the last verse of Genesis chapter 13. Is that Abraham moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth trees of Nanu, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. The Mamre means manliness, and Hebron means society or friendship, uh, stable strength, firm. So, and coming down to page seven in your notes, in this move by Abraham, desired to separate himself to the Lord away from Sodom and Gomorrah uh, before it was destroyed. It was beautiful, right? That's why Lord chose it. Uh, those vast cities of the plain. He desired no city here. And Hebrews 11 chapter, Hebrew 11 chapter 10 says, Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. He was not impressed by, by Sodom and Gomorrah and how beautiful it was and how beautifully the city was built and constructed. He was not impressed. But again, like the Hebrew says, he was confidently looking forward to a city. He was constantly searching to that city whose, whose foundations was eternal, whose, uh, whose designer and architect, so to say, was God himself. Okay, um, so not only did he live a pilgrim's life, denying himself the pleasures of the world, but he took the step of separating himself to God. He wanted to be in communion with his Lord in a quiet place of fellowship, Hebron. Okay, uh, one of the first steps to communi communion with the Lord is separation. Now that's the root meaning, the root word for holiness, isn't it? Uh, holiness simply means set apart. When we say God is holy, he is set apart. There is no one like him. And when we choose to set ourselves apart from the things of the world, from the desires of the flesh, desires of the world, um, that is the first step for our communion with God, our intimacy it just grows deeper and deeper. And we see that Abraham decides to do that. Okay, right, are you all uh, with me so far? Everything good? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, uh, here I'll, I'll stop sharing the screen because uh, the next sacrifice, um, next altar does not require it. So, altar of obedience, the first altar, altar of intimacy, uh, and, and the altar of commitment, recommitment, or separation was the third altar. And then finally, we come to the fourth, fourth altar, the altar of sacrifice. Okay? The altar of sacrifice. And once again, we all know the story. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 9, um, we are in page number 7. In your notes, it says, Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. So at this point, by this point, uh, Abraham uh, you know, gets a son called uh, Isaac, and you know, there's a lot of things that happens between Genesis 13 and Genesis 22. He's now a father. He, he now has the promised child that God promised him that he would have, okay? And after all these years, he's built all these altars, and then God tells him to sacrifice uh, his son, his one and only son, okay? So let's, let's just look at it. How is it that the man who is now called the father of many nations is asked to offer up the only heir he had as a burnt offering? Who would then carry on the promised seed? What would happen to the covenant that promise? 
Also, how about the covenant that God made with him regarding the land, his descendants, his inheritance? What about all of that? What would happen? How will all the nations of the earth be blessed without the promise seed? Abraham never put these questions to the Lord. Once again, as he always did, he simply obeyed. I, 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 for the life of me, I cannot imagine what Abraham is going through. Um, you know, I have a son. Uh, I, I, to a certain extent, I can relate. You know, what? I mean, those are all the questions that I would ask. Okay, what about your promises? What about descendants? You know, if Ethan, my son, was my promised child that God said that I would have, and he would you know his inheritance and will inherit the land and everything and whatnot. I will start thinking logically and then emotionally. It's like, how can you call yourself good? Are you good? How can you be so cruel with God? You're asking for my only son. What, what is this? This is not fair. And, and Abraham never seemed to put these questions to the Lord. He obeyed, it says. Um, and he, he simply built. Um, I would like to know the truth of what he told Sarah. <laughs> uh, imagine waking up, telling his wife, yeah, I'm just going to take my child and you know, our son and I'm going to sacrifice him. Yeah. <laughs> imagine the wrath <laughs> that Sarah would have pulled out. Um, and here's the thing, okay? It, again, in the notes I mentioned, it simply says that God did not want Isaac. He wanted the heart of Abraham. Abraham, it was Abraham who was really upon the altar, not Isaac. Uh, Abraham has been on that altar for three days because the trek was about three days. Some of the scholars say the trek the walk from the time that he left to reach the place uh, was approximately three days. So from the time he got that news and God tells him to do this, it was Abraham on the altar. Wow. And wow. Okay. So let's um, and see what the Hebrews have to tell. In the book of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17 to 19, we read that it was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Now, Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. Abraham kind of some, just knew somehow, you know, in this journey of his intimacy, in this, in this lifelong pursuit of, of him and God, he somehow learned that, hey, you know, if something were to happen, if, even if Isaac dies, I know that God can raise him up. Man. Um, you know, verse 19, that's what it says. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. Right. Um, so let's just pause there, guys. Okay. This is the fourth altar, the altar of sacrifice from the altar of obedience to the altar of intimacy to the altar of commitment, recommitment or separation to the altar of sacrifice. And I just want to ask us, uh, you know, these questions, you know, I mentioned that altars was a place, uh, it was like the landmarks in our lives. Right. You know, how many of us have those landmark moments, you know, when I was 18 uh, in that room on so and so date, God showed up to me, God spoke to me. You know, do we have those moments? 
Yeah. I'm, I'm sure we do, right? Those are the altar moments where God rescued us, where God heard our cry. He heard my cry and he responded to me. And at that point, I have built an altar. Right? That is, you are building your history with God. Right? And as I've shared before, and I can, uh, in this Bible, I can take you to certain chapters, uh, you know, in certain books and say, it's like, you know, on so-and-so date when I was this old, when I was 18, 19, 20, 21, at this time, he spoke to me through this passage. And so those are the landmark moments. Uh, those are the altar moments. Right? I built an altar as the remembrance of God's faithfulness and his goodness and his promise and his word. So the couple of questions that I want to ask us regarding this whole uh, altar is, one, do you remember the places where God has shown up in your life? In the past, do you remember the places where God has spoken to you? Okay, can I ask the question again? Do you remember the places that God has shown up to you in the past? Do you remember those moments when God has spoken to you? Okay, you can write this question down and uh, ask yourself, answer it later for yourself. Do you remember? Second thing, what has called you away from those promises? Like we see, we saw in, in Abraham's life between Genesis chapter 12 and 13, we see that he went to Egypt because of severe famine and whatnot. Um, and so he went away from the promise of God, from the land that God promised, he went away. Um, is there anything in your life that's caused you that or that's called you away from the promise that God told you that you would do? And finally, will you come back? Are you willing to come back to that altar of recommitment and separation? That's the third question. Are you willing to come back? Um, and God is expecting us to come back. And, uh, and if, if, if you don't mind, can we, uh, can someone uh, read Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16, please? Well, it was quick to turn the Bible. But invites us to follow his ancient paths. As we read Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. Anybody? Can I read this? Yes, please. Go ahead. Yeah. Thus says the Lord, stand in the ways and see, and ask for the old path, bear the good ways, and walk in it, they, sorry, then you will find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. Yeah. Thank you, Manu. Um, he says that, stand across, stand at the crossroads and look, ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. Ask for where the good way is and walk in it. Ask for the ancient paths. Um, that is in parallel to the third question. Are you willing to come back? Are you willing to come back to those good ways, to those ancient paths and recommit? And finally, in the altar of sacrifice, one of the last questions is, in Romans chapter 12, we are in page 8 in your notes at this moment. Right on top, Paul writes, Romans chapter 12, verse 1, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, it means I, Paul, beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, in all of this, what I have learned is that God is not only asking you, God is not only asking us to build altars as in, in remembrance of his faithfulness, but he's also asking us to be on the altar. 
Okay, can I say that again? He is not only expecting us to build the altars, but he's expecting us to be on the altar that we've built. That means altars again represent a place of worship. That means there cannot be any other false worship happening in our lives. Isn't it? There cannot be another thing, something or someone taking the place of God. Once that is clear, you live a life that is worthy of a call. That is, you live a life as a living sacrifice. So the question, the fourth question was, are we on the altar for God? Okay. So can I say those four questions just one last time? Where, do you remember where God has shown up to you in the past? Do you remember the words that he's spoken to you? And second question is, what has called you away from, from that? And third question, will you come back to those ancient paths? Will you come back to those ways, those good ways? And finally, the fourth question is, are you willing to be on the altar for God? And in the short poem there, it says, but we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. Can I read that again? But we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. It's another poem. Is your, is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Your hearts does the spirit control. You can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as you yield him your body and soul. Okay. Um, so are you guys with me? Yes. So what were your key takeaways from what we just discussed so far? What were your, what were some of the points that kind of stood out to you? From the four altars, from the life of Abraham, from the four altars that he built. Okay. Do you mind sharing that? Anybody, guys, who don't hesitate. You can feel free to unmute and uh, speak as well. Prince, do you want to share, please? Would you like to? Is it the third one. Yeah, the third one, the altar of commitment. It's uh, a completely separate for the kingdom of God that uh, it's like willing to work for only God. Thanks, Prince. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, I'd like all of us to share if that's okay. It's just, you know, very few people in the class. So. Dave, uh, I know you mentioned that, yeah, what, would you like to unmute and uh, share? Sure. Yeah. So the, the thing is, um, well, Abraham, uh, God called him, but he was not well introduced with God because he was, uh, just like you mentioned, he was uh, from the background of uh, the, the idol worshiper. But, but when he obeys God and he gradually uh, develops his uh, his bond with God. So from creating first altar um, of obedience, and then moving to the, the the altar of intimacy, and then moving on to commitment. When he uh, goes falls away from God's plan, but he comes back again and commits himself uh, okay. and, and separates himself from other things. Uh, okay. And again, he moves on to uh, the sacrifice, ultimate sacrifice. So. Uh, his life totally, even though we've learned, I mean, we've heard stories of, of him, but we are, personally, I haven't looked his life 
as this perspective. So it uh, kind of uh, changes my uh, my thought towards Abraham and his relationship with God. Thank you very much. Okay. Amen. And thanks, Dave. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. yeah. Siddharth, so Kanan, feel free to share. Even I'd like to take all four of because it's uh, uh, really uh, all four points um, touched my heart. Um, where the obedience is a very powerful thing. Uh, the reasons objected was of the disobedience. God says uh, obedience is better than the sacrifice. It's it's very yeah. important. The life of Abraham is uh, so really he doesn't know where he's going. He's just obey God and taking a step of faith and going towards the uh, yeah. where he doesn't know the land. On the of course the intimate walk with God is very, very important. Um the commitment and separation also where uh, even I was and I preached in a church, Lot was a stumbling block to his calling. But when he separated from the Lord, God has came and told him, now you look at the land and the how much the everything I will give to you. When we right. submit ourselves to the commit uh, committed to the work of God and the world and the unwanted things God will show up and he will bless and he will be with us and he will guide us and uh, to be altered yeah. sac as a sacrifice is a powerful thing really uh, yeah. wonderful everything is touched my heart once again I uh, you know just went through the Abraham's life today thank you so much yeah. thanks Thomas thank you for sharing that yeah Kanan, I think there's something wrong with the mic. Uh, you, you un I can see you unmuting, but uh, we can't hear you. Uh, yeah, I can see. I can see that your mic is unmuted, but I'm unable to hear it. Or is it just me? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Now I can hear. Uh, I was uh, sharing at uh, fourth altar. Uh, I like the way he said, God did not want Isaac, but he wanted the heart of Abraham. Yeah. That point uh, Thanks, really touched Tony. me. Thanks, Tony. You're Thanks welcome. Yeah. Manu, uh, Kiran, please feel free to share. I want all of us to share, including Sharon. Yeah, for me, just something stands out in the, uh, the third altar, the altar of commitment and separation, and uh, and also the scripture of Jeremiah 6, verse 16, uh, where it talks about, you know, I mean, when I just read the scripture, it just talks about, like, I was just remembering of my past life, where there's so many crossroads in my life, and I have to take a right decision to walk in it. And when I took the right decision, there was, for some time that I walked, for you know, and it's always the flesh that pulls me back to my past life, and uh, you know, as, as in the 16th verse, it, in the last it says, "But you said we will not walk in it." So it's the mm -hmm. same thing. Like for me, I be walking. There's always ups and downs in life, right. and especially in mine. And I always walk in the right way for some time, and again I go back and say that I will not walk into it. So right. it's I don't know it's a process for me. Yeah. Thanks for that. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, and that's where the, the that third question comes in, isn't it? And will you come back? You know, that's the it's a wonderful thing. Yeah. Thanks for sharing this about. Sorry, Manu, uh, you were about to share. Go ahead. Yes, uh, I really uh, learned all four altars, and first is obedience. Yes, obedience to faith, and when we walk up faith, then really we uh, go uh, to uh, obedience and uh, and I really like intimacy intimacy is journey with God and uh, I like also this one the order of sacrifice this is remembrance of God yeah really I like uh, all four points thanks man thanks thanks for sharing yeah Kiran Yes, Hello, sir. sir. 
Okay, you uh, Sharon. Uh, Sharon, you'll go after Kiran. You'll share after Kiran. Yes, sir. Sure. Go ahead, Kiran. Okay, thank you, sir. So whenever I hear uh, about Abraham, I I learn new thing. Whenever I hear, so today also the four four uh, four points is very touch the altar, and first the obedience. I I it's just too much. I learn also so many things. When we uh, I used to stay like a comfort zone and the God so something different. So. Uh, we have to leave that comfort zone and then we have to move at first the uh, as like when uh, the god called abraham to go that place but uh, he didn't say it like uh, go uh, that place the proper place but abraham obey obey and he just step take take uh, the faith step and he moved yeah uh, yeah. Like that, so it's very touch. Whenever uh, uh, the obedience is very important uh, through my life, sir. So I, I, it's touch too much. Yes, yeah, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Kiran. Thank you for sharing. Sharon, please go ahead. So uh, as we see, uh, Abraham's life that uh, Abraham was fully dependent upon God. Wherever he goes, uh, he was having full faith on God that uh, God is with him. So when it comes to a second altar, the altar of intimacy, when uh, he was uh, with uh, God was with him wherever he was going. Yeah. Uh, and he was fully dependent. And intimacy means uh, God knows him and uh, he knows God that uh, what is going in his life. You know, yeah. my life also, whenever I'm uh, seeing about Abraham that... Uh, in our life, we should know God, and God should know our plan, and we should have intimacy of intimacy with God. That uh, whatever we are planning, that plan should be uh, of God's plan, and God yeah. should know our plan. Yeah. So thank you, sir. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for you know um, for sharing your thoughts. Um, again, I. Don't ask these questions to put you in a hard spot, you know, to get the right answer or not. But, uh, but thank you for sharing. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing. So uh, I'm glad that we could learn something today. And uh, I'll stop the session here. And uh, we will uh, meet again next week. And uh, we'll, we'll resume from, from, from the next point. Okay. And we look at worship ministry in the Old Testament in our next session. All right, guys. Cool. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, you all have a lovely day. God bless you all, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir.